Thank yeah. You, thank you very much. Thank you very Thanks. much. Very good. Very good. Okay. It so. sounds like a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. All right. So, hello, hello. This is Derek from One Over Tea. And Alex from One Over Tea. Wow. Amazing. Incredible. How could it be? Yep. The <laughs> last time we did a podcast together was virtual. You were in Hafeng, and we talked about the fiasco. Yes, we did. Out of a tin can on my end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Apologies for that audio, but hopefully this audio will be a little better. Mm. Uh, yeah, that was a really interesting episode. I think we got a lot of feedback about, you know, how difficult it is to actually do this kind of cooperative stuff we're doing on the mountain with the villagers. Sure. And I think uh, it kind of goes into a lot of what I talk about in the podcast where we're kind of unveiling the myth behind, like, Chinese tea farming, Chinese tea farmers, what it means to live in China and work in China, and then working with these villagers, trying to get them to go organic, and I think, uh, I, you actually, recently you said you won over some of the villagers. Yeah, so I guess like the, the enemy number one, or the, the guy in the village who was most opposed to organic was this guy named Yulin. And he was recently in the hospital. He finally got cirrhosis. So like, he was definitely like earning it though. He, this is the guy, like, he would come to every meeting like totally drunk. And oh, okay. went to the hospital. And then his son's a teacher. And I met his son in the course of the events. Anyways, he goes to the hospital, he comes out, then his wife gets sick, right? Oh. And he was up there picking tea, and then all by himself, again, he had to follow along, because there was a meeting back in January, where the village team leader, Wang Changshan, said, okay, we're all going to try to go organic this year, we're going to accept the yield production, with the promise that come July, we're going to give juicier dividends, right? Yes. It'll be easier for us to market you if you, do, if you go organic. So Yulin was kind of dragging his feet, going along with it, cursing us along the way. Uh, then he gets sick, and his wife gets sick. So he's back up there picking tea by himself and then carrying it down the mountain. And then that one day was me and this other guy, Giacomo, maybe we'll meet later, cool. and we're just taking the tea down the hill for him. Mm -hmm. And it was a simple gesture. It was like carrying the tea down the mountain. But his son heard about that and met me in Enshu the next night, and then... They said that they talked to the dad, Yulin, in question, and he's on board. Wow. So this is the guy who was most opposed to it. And now he will at least tolerate our efforts until July. But I'm sure at the end of the day, whether or not we actually can raise their income will be the factor that determines if they go along for it. Now they're convinced, okay, we're not just assholes out here trying to ruin them, trying to undermine their livelihood. There is something to this. And hopefully, again, if they make more money together, uh, with us, with going organic, I think it could be a lasting change. Um, so he was definitely the most opposed to it, and now at least has a smile on his face. You know, I think now he's really. I think he's kind of also changed his tune in general uh, when it comes to the cooperative. Because his son, that evening, was like really saying, "Okay, we're gonna have to really think more about tea." You know, because Yulin was the guy last year who was like, "We should just." Uh, sell, sell all the fields, have some boss come in here, right? That's Build a factory, and, and then, and now uh, it, it seems like he's more serious about trying to figure out with the resources we have now, with the tea fields he has now, what can we do to make it more of, of a sustainable, agriculturally <laughs> oriented project, right? He was thinking about planting fruit trees am among the, the tea plants, right, or whatever. Oh, yeah. So he's thinking in a new direction. So. Okay, I mean, it's it's amazing how. How much one small kind act, act of kindness? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's right. It <clears throat> didn't really save him much time. Right. It didn't really help him materially in any substantial way. But it was but just it, like it, building guanxi, I guess. Right. It just makes me wonder, like, in the past, did he not experience those kinds of acts of, like, <clears throat> solidarity that we would like to say? That, like, that's right. I, cause before, I was always just like, we're having a meeting, right? Yeah, come here to the meeting. Here's the meeting. Day, like, here's the document. And I, please read the, please do your homework, right? <clears throat> I prepared this document. And here's how I'm going to, you know, like, so it was always like, come to the meeting. Here's the document. And I think that worked for maybe some of the party members there because they could see the intention behind it, right? Right. And that's, could, that's one thing I wanted to bring up, too, the intentionality where it's like, sure, we have very good intentions. Sure. But... Do we have the actual effect yet? Like, is, sure, is, sure, is their sure. livelihood being raised or not? Is it just wasting time in meetings? You know, that's right. And yeah. then seeing somebody who's actually helping you take tea down from the mountain that goes beyond just that's the right. intentions. Right? That's right. Yeah. So that, I guess that was for him certainly. Mm, the second thing, which I would say is like, so like last year, of course, we did the, the small token dividends, right? Mm -hmm. 
not a substantial which, which sum we, of money. We brought out of our own pockets, right? Completely our own pockets. They, they <laughs> put nothing towards that materially, right? Like they didn't, it was not their tea that, that made us that money. Yeah. I think initially, for those we who tried. remember, there was like the Hafong Solidarity Sampler. I think we sold like four of those last yeah. spring. So that was absolutely not. So we made like less than 200 bucks. That's and, right, yeah. So and it was then not, gave, the, gave the villagers each like, 500, 500 RMB a pop. Yeah, so like ninety dollars each uh, for ten households. Eight, eight. Eight households, yeah. Yep. So. But yeah. So. But that's, see, that's that that's the point of like okay, sometimes we do need to bring it past intentionality, even if it's even if it's not there yet. This is like the idea of like kind of running any business, like faking it till you make it. Yep, we're that's just right. Like, we're not there yet, but we want everyone to believe it. <laughs> And so, and so we'll fund it ourselves, we'll do this ourselves, we'll, we'll take this cut, we'll eat this cost, and then really just doing a lot of that to make it start rolling in its own. And so I remember you showed a interesting uh, group chat screenshot where you're like, hey guys, we're going to do this meeting or something like that. And all the villagers gave you a shota. So like, like, I got it. What, I'll be there, I'll be there, I'll be there. What, what that was about was, so um, <coughs> historically, Blush Jinping, who, uh, who was the leader of the cooperative, or village leader initially, right? He would come up the mountain every year to pick the tea, right, in, in his van. He does not dare this year to go anywhere because uh, the cooperative is deeply in debt down below, right? And like, I think he's embarrassed to go up there. Uh, he doesn't want to like, he feels like, oh, I, I, so he feels like the people, they, they just become unreasonable, right? So his attitude is, bec is becoming less cooperative. He feels like everyone's just unreasonable and they're all pushing me so hard and they all want money right now. And he, I think, you know, this is a materially derived emotional state because he's not been selling to you well and he hasn't had money even to pay past accounts completely, right? right. So like, because of that, he feels like, oh, everyone's being so unreasonable, everyone's pushing me, everyone's, you know, they're all being so mean to me. Um, and, you know, certainly they have been unreasonable occasionally, as we experienced. Not unreasonable, but they have been occasionally... Recalcitrant. <laughs> no, what's, what's the best word for this? Like, there are a few households which are, like, if, if you read, like, William Hinton's account of socialism in the, the villages, in, in Longbow Village in Shanxi, there are always a couple rascals in any cooperative, right, who are like undermining the project. Like in our case, like Auntie Tong, she's the one who will like that, sneak. That's not our popo? That's not our popo, that's, oh, okay. that's Tan popo. She's fine, but like Auntie Tong is the one who, uh, when she noticed we were, because it was supposed to be organic tea, right? My initial idea for the first week was we're gonna give them an, an inflated price, right? Organic tea, you should get a better price because you guys have accepted less of a yield, right? right? So we're gonna give you an inflated price right at the farm gate which for most of the households, happily received, we're all went well. We're subsidizing you to like, to yeah. please, to thank you for like, we're taking on the risk, right, yeah. too, but thank you for, you know, following along. And within three days, she figured out she could go down to the bridge and buy all this non-organic tea and take it up the trail. No one would see her. So like, her, <laughs> her yield went from like 10, 10 gin this day, 15 gin, 90 gin. And I was like, what, what's going on? <laughs> and, 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 on. and then she's just like, yeah, she just took, and she, and she mixed it together, but she didn't uh, check it. She didn't check it. She got swindled at, 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 the, at, the, at the bridge because like within the bags, the bundles she brought, like it was longjing on the outside, but it was Piang Tudza on the inside. Like different cultivars? Different cultivars, that's right. Like, different obvious, cultivars. Like... Semi-obvious, but like, so they're all mixed together. And like, when it got down to the factory, Grandpa Sun was just like, this is useless. So he he made it still, but he separated it, right? Oh, wow. So like, so that, we I'm, ha I'm happy Swoon knows enough to like. Yeah, see he, the, he, see he, the he be like, nope. Nope. Yeah, and then uh, I I got a call from Law that night, who's just like, you find Chella. It's like you, you flip the car over. You you've messed up big big time now. You, you, you find Chella. You you flip the car over. Like, uh, yeah, now Tom knows what's up. And you know, we had like a the next day. I went to, up to our landlord, also part of this village up top, Wang Jiangguo, and I was just like. Um, if this keeps happening, like, the whole project's gonna fail, right? And then yeah. be like, we all need to kind of like, you know, close ranks here and make sure she doesn't do that again. <laughs> and all, we need to hu shang jen do, you all need to kind of supervise each other to make sure, or else the project's not gonna work. And I think just like, you know, historically, the people's communes in China, they acted cooperatively together, but there was no real room for sort of market speculation activity. It was kind of involuntary. In the same way, We've made it involuntary in this situation because if you don't, the idea is if you don't cooperate, if you don't go along with this, there is going to be no project, no inflated price. And this year, no one was going up to the mountain to get their tea. 
There was no competing factories. There's a glut on the market, right? Nobody wants their crummy picked tea from an inconvenient location, right? Yeah. So there is no market competition functionally in this situation. So consequently, if we say, hey, either we all work together or we're not going to do it, that you know, creates a situation where you kind of have to close ranks, right? And or else you do something else. You just don't right. do tea this plant, season. Plant fruit trees. Or plant fruit trees, or you know, you do something else, right? So yeah, no, it's it's on that on that borders of monopoly, where it's just like a sure. dangerous situation to be like, hey, like either you play by our rules or no one's making any money. Yeah, like, yeah, but it's like unfortunate because like also like we're the only means to like actually make it a viable product, right? That's right. Yeah, because I mean, how, we, yeah. Have, we have like the 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 Taobao store, like the Amazon store. Right? Sure. And so that's actually making some, a little bit of profit. We're showing that it is potentially sellable. Uh, as you mentioned, there's a glut on the market where it's like across all of China, right? Correct, it's like the correct. Tea, the tea market this year in 2024 is so far down. Prices essentially across the board have dropped, except for like really high regions. Like uh, Xihu Longjing, that stayed pretty stable. A lot of the nicer villages in Yunnan have stayed pretty stable. Fooding white tea has dropped. Like, and so the percentage is, is down a little bit. And everyone's just like, man, this is a hard economy. And That's so, right, yeah. So in a, in a hard year for tea, right, you know, we have to try to, like, maybe it's not possible to, to sell all the tea in China or to, like, fix the general situation. But I still think it's possible for one small community of eight to ten households, depending if Qingbin comes back or not, eight to ten households can probably find a place in the international retail market and at least make that more sustainable for them. Exactly. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's a small ship, right? That's right. A small ship, I think, can make it through these dangerous waters. But I think, <laughs> yeah, most of the fleet's going to sink. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, because you mentioned, the, you told me about Zhang Jiajie, where they've, yeah. just kind of, they've outlawed Jiating Nongchang. It's like household, household green tea farms in the entire city of Zhang Jiajie, where they have the Hallelujah Mountains in Hunan. They've just said, nobody can Sha Qing their tea anymore. They've closed down all of the small household factories. Nobody can make the, they can, nobody can kill the green. Nobody can make green tea, except for like a certain amount of beer. I, I think, yeah, factories. so you have to be like a, a registered enterprise, right, factory. Yeah. So if it's like your own household production, you either own wok or you're making it, they've gone around and they've put these <laughs> strips of paper over it, right? Like, all right, you can't touch this it's this forbidden. year. It's forbidden, so. But that's a response to there being inflation of tea. That's right. There really is, well, I mean, it, it, there's a glut of product, right? Yeah. So the prices are deflated. And in that situation, I mean, if you think about this from like a policymaker perspective, you need to reduce the tea on the market, right? Mm -hmm. So on the, and on the one hand, by going after these smaller producers, they are probably lower quality. There's less yeah. standardization. But at the same time, you're protecting the enterprises who are giving you tax revenue. That's, that's also true, yeah. So it's like... <laughs> um, these small producers here are definitely bearing more, more of the brunt of this economic downturn or yeah. this glut of tea, whereas these bigger producers now, hey, they get, they get less competition, right? right? Government still gets their taxes, uh, but these small producers, you got to do something else, right? Sorry, you can't make your tea. All you can do is pick it. So you're only going to get the value of picking the tea. You're not going to get the value of production. Yeah, I mean, and this is... You know, it comes as a, an extra blow to us because we've always seen like tea as that cash crop in these rural areas sure. where it's like, yeah, like, okay, you have, you have coal and bamboo. The coal mines are dried up. Remember, this is Anhui. Sure. <laughs> what, are you, what are you going to do? This is the Long, Longshan. Remember Longshan? Sure, sure. Dragon <laughs> they had, Mountain. They had coal, they had bamboo, the coal mountain dried up. They can sell bamboo or they can make tea. And tea is like their only really option to like create a product that transcends their domestic bounds where it's like you can sell this all throughout China all throughout the world but if everyone is doing that in small villages in China suddenly it becomes a flood of tea we have too much tea and so then tea is not essentially the saving grace for these small villages is there another option the yeah, yeah, is the Tourism? option so so right now the well I mean it it's kind of like apples in America, right? Okay. Remember Red Delicious or Pink Lady? Gross. Yeah, these, yeah gross. But in the 80s and 90s, they were like the big new thing, right? Yeah. So all these farmers, cherry farmers in like central Washington, tore out their tor Ooh. cherry trees to Jeez. plant these Red Delicious or Pink Lady apples, which 
Five years later, the market didn't want anymore. Now they're gross. So suddenly you have all these apple trees, a lot of water, a lot of maintenance, a lot of investment to get it going. And just like with tea, if you go pull out the tea, you plant something else. You could plant corn, you could plant wheat, you could plant uh, one of these you know, grains, potatoes here often in these mountainous areas of the Southwest. You're not gonna make any real profit off of that. You know? yeah. You're making yeah. a couple hundred R and B, that's yeah. right. You, but, can, you can feed your family, yeah. But something I saw just yesterday when we were out there is, you know, like the, like Zongzi, right? Mm -hmm. The wrappings, the wrapping paper for that, yeah. the, the Zongye, yeah, which is so something. These are, these are the sticky rice dumplings, usually in like pyramid triangle shapes. And um, they get wrapped in the, bamboo leaves. either bamboo leaves, uh, but in this case, it's a special kind of like, I guess it's like a cousin of bamboo, little small plant. It grows very similar to bamboo. It takes three years to get it going. Hmm. Yesterday when we were going through El Meishan, I saw they had it going. And I asked them, like, oh, you guys do Zongye here? And she's like, yeah, this year is really getting big. Same thing in Hafang. In Hafang, all of these tea producers have torn out their tea to plant now. Because right now, you can make, whereas maybe you will only make two to 3,000 RMB per mu, okay. the sixth of an acre on tea, you could make 9,000 per mu on Liao Ye this year. This year. And then in three years, when they've actually gotten their first harvest of it, I bet you, suddenly, because right now the demand is way above supply, where everyone's going to go plant their, their Liao Ye, their Zong Ye, yeah. they're going to wait two or three years, and then suddenly... Supply is huge, yeah. Supply is huge, and then that's just the... I guess the, the problem with agriculture is like... Um, you can't really plant. You can't really deal with nature completely. In a, in a, it's not like you know, like stock, right? Or it's all like, okay, buy, 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 sell, 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 drop it, dump yeah, it, you right? Need, you, you need have years. To, of, you yeah. need years, you, especially for these things that aren't, um, you know, just like uh, corn or potatoes, where it's a one season. It's not a ninety-day investment. It's a years and years of investment kind of deal. Yeah. So we're actually we're not in Hafeng or Hubei right now. We are not. <laughs> Even though we were just talking about it, this is the first time I've seen you in like a year. That's correct. Yeah, I think it's been a year. <laughs> yeah, last, yeah, last yeah. April, right? Last yeah. April, yeah. Last time, last time we went to the Guapian. Yeah. Yep. And so it's wild, you know, we're in this cooperative together. You guys are here in Hubei. You're doing so much stuff in Hubei and Ensure and Hufeng that obviously there's a lot to talk about. We'll probably talk about that in another episode later. Probably in Ensure. <laughs> probably in Ensure, maybe <laughs> yeah. with, with a woofer or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but what we're doing here is we're actually in Chengdu, outside of Chengdu, in a small city called Meishan. Meishan is on the way to Luoshan. It's by Emershan. And we're sourcing this tea. This is the green tea, the jasmine green tea. We found a few other teas as well, but the jasmine is really what brought us here. So the purpose of this episode is really to talk about sourcing jasmine tea, how we got here, what we discovered, and the information Alex has written down in his little notebook here. <laughs> Yeah, so, so keeping strict accounts. <laughs> <laughs> so Alex, how, how, did we, how did we end up in Meishan? So my advisor for my master's uh, program back in Jingzhou, Wulian Wu Shilian, she was from here. And Meishan. she had always, from Meishan, and she always talked about, oh, we have tea in my hometown. You guys sell tea, you should sell my tea. And for two or three years, I was just like, sure, sure, sure whatever. <laughs> like, you know, I was not super excited about it. There was a reputation about Sichuan tea, maybe I had learned in Ensha, I was like, oh, this is just cheap, you know, maybe, all I knew was it was cheap, right, and it was like, they kind of copy everywhere else, right, mm -hmm. so I was not super excited about it, um, but nonetheless, I, I kind of always like dismissed it, dismissed it, uh, and then finally, um, you know, there was someone who was asking about uh, jasmine tea, and I had been given a sample, because eventually she told her friend, um, who was not in tea, uh, who is not in agricultural economics, just this person she grew up with. Hey, you know, I have this uh, foreign student here and they sell tea and like, can you figure out some tea from our hometown and send some samples? And he did. And I drank them and they're pretty good. Yeah, I was like I shocked. Like yeah. I was like, I, I, they were shockingly good. So like, I, I, I have never really liked jasmine tea. I've never really sought it out. I've had like the jasmine flowers as a nice decaf because mm. they're really fragrant. They're very nice, beautiful. But as far as like the jasmine tea goes, I've never had a really good jasmine tea I like. I think my problem though is I was looking at Fujian. And so I was looking at Fujianese jasmine teas and I was like, okay, this is a little too, the green tea isn't right. They were all like the rolled, like the rolled pearls, right? Little a, pearls are just A lot, a lot broken, of rolled pearls, but a lot of the giant. green style teas in Fujian, they're just not doing right in my opinion. Ah, okay. uh, and so like the white tea jasmine was really good, but that was very expensive. And so you sent the samples of the jasmine from Sichuan and I drank them and I was like, these are actually really good. 
because it has that old adage, right, where you see the jasmine flowers, or you smell the jasmine flowers, you taste the green tea. Uh, and then there's also, you know, the green tea, the white teas, and we started buying it, and we sold a little bit of it, and now it's like, okay, like, where does this actually come from? And so this is the sourcing trip for it. Yep, that's right. And, yeah, I mean, it certainly has been a very productive day, two days. I feel like <laughs> we, we, we did a lot, we, we saw a lot, we, we learned a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like I have a much better appreciation for Sichuan tea now, and, like, what it can do. I feel like, you know, maybe it was just, like, a... A well, bias born of competition. I think that well, maybe it, let's 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 unpack your previous idea of you know why you didn't like Sichuan tea. Sure. So and so yeah. for for me, one of the big things is like oh like everything like all the knockoffs of any tea style in China, Silver Needle, Bilo Chun, Dragon Well, Dragon Well, it's <laughs> it's all grown in Sichuan. It's all grown in Sichuan. Anji Bai Cha. We saw a bunch of Anji Bai Cha being yep. planted out here. Anji Bai Cha. It's all grown in Sichuan and then shipped out to the rest of the world. And the issue here is not the fact that the tea tastes not as good as what it is in the, in the core region. It's just, a, it's just dishonest a little bit, in our opinion. Right? So the first encounter we had with Sichuan tea in a negative <laughs> uh, context, you may remember. Tao uh, Shubao. In fact, some of you may have already had some Sichuan tea, and you loved it, <laughs> and you loved it. Uh, it was, there was this cooperative in Enshi, Tao Shubao, and they sold us red tea. And every year the red tea is a little bit different. And, and, and you know, this, this is a close cooperative in Ensure. That's this right. This is the very first cooperative we started working with. This is right. kind of the reason Alex moved from Jiangsu all the way out to Hubei. That's right. To get closer to this cooperative, you've, you've been with them during several Kill Pig days. That's right, yep. You've hung out with them, we've walked the fields, we know the, the, the maker, the nephew. Their kids, the, the wife, the we brother. Felt, we felt pretty close to this cooperative. And as it turned out, their neighbor, you know, again, not completely out of the good of his heart, also if I'm sure for a competitive situation, right, <laughs> revealed, oh, I know where they get their, their red tea. That comes from Sichuan. Check this out. And he showed us, like, the exact same exact teas we had tea. bought from them weeks earlier. So, yeah, what can I say? They were buying tea from Sichuan, and they were doing it for the same reason that many producers in Insha or in Hangzhou, for that matter, in a moment we can talk about that, or in, in Suzhou, buy tea from here, it's, it's much cheaper. It's yeah. much cheaper and the quality is fine. The quality and, is very good, yeah. yeah you don't, it's not like you're, you're tasting like you know, heavy metals or anything crazy <laughs> like that. It, it tastes fine, it looks fine, it smells great. So like, you can get the same quality product here much earlier in the year oh, right. for a cheaper price. When I say early, like, they were picking, uh, here, like they had tea on, ready to go by the end of Chinese New Year's, right? Yeah, February. In February, the that's end correct. Of February, yeah. The end of February, middle of February. Middle I mean. of February, February 15th, yeah. And they said they, they lost a lot because of the frost. We'll talk about that later. <clears throat> sure, but sure. But like, that's, that's part of the issue if you're making tea that early. So, and yeah, so, yeah. And so, yeah, so we're seeing is just a flood of Sichuan teas on the market, mislabeled as other teas from other regions. And so it's not that Sichuan has a bad reputation for making bad tea. It's just that a lot of the tea that we don't want to come from Sichuan comes from Sichuan. <laughs> That's right, yeah. yeah. So on the one hand, as a consumer, you know, it, it's a bummer because you don't really know what the product is. There's an incentive. People, they're incentivized in Suzhou and Hangzhou and Enshi as well to bring tea over from here and then you know, repackage it. But also as a producer, like, you know, it's frustrating that the first tea we got in Hafeng we picked on March 22nd, mm -hmm. a full month. After. After Sichuan already had their trucks rolling out, right? Yeah. So I remember looking on WeChat and seeing people March 1st were, were posting, even in Hafeng, I got new green tea. Yep. There's no way they had new green tea March 1st at anywhere in Hafeng. Yeah, any must of those have, must have been imported. Probably was, was brought from Sichuan, right? But yeah. like, so by the time you have your honest tea, March 23rd, March 24th, posting on WeChat, you're already three, four weeks behind the first post, right? And I remember... And I brought my little sample to like the dean in my department. I was like, oh, do you, do you want some tea, right? Uh, and I saw on his table, he had already had like all of these samples laid out from oh, other factories, man. right? Who probably had sent it there like, weeks before, right? Jeez, so, yeah. yeah, we were late, late to the party. <laughs> yeah, so Sichuan is just incredibly productive, very early, and they're learning a lot of different styles. Like what we have here that we'll we, keep hinting at is a bunch of Dragonwell green tea from the factory we visited. 
the maker was just like very clear, like, yeah, like, uh, actually, is this from the factory? No. So it is not from that factory. They have, they have like two factories. So it was the, where we went was like their main factory. Uh, and then they have another factory over in Chemway, which I guess is where the jasmine tea gets finally made. Oh, right. That's where the, this Longjing was made. So yeah, so they they have a maker that makes Longjing in Chenwei. They have a maker that makes Bilo Chun here, and they're very proud of it. They're like, you know, if we want, if you want, we can make that for you. It's the best seller. <laughs> yeah, if you want Longjing, we got Longjing. You want Bilo Chun, we make tons of Bilo Chun. Yeah. They, he used to he used to have a store in Suzhou, or he would That's just right, yeah. he would just sell Bilo Chun. That was most From of their Suzhou. money. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so. We've learned a lot on this trip, and we'll kind of get into it. But first, a, a quick little geolog geological survey on what is Emershan, what is Chengdu. So Chengdu is kind of like the last outpost, kind of before the Sichuan step, right? Before like the lands get really, really high, inhospitable. And if you look on a map, you'll see roads, you'll see cities, all the way into the west of China. And then you hit Chengdu, and it just stops, right? They're, they're like. No more highways, no more roads. This is where people would get exiled to back in like the Tang Dynasty and like the ancient China. It's like, we don't want you here in Nanjing. We don't want you here in Hangzhou. You go out to as far west as you and can it go. It does feel like really far away from everything else <laughs> in but this it's, country. It's really cool because it's a, we're right by Emershan or Lushan. Emershan is an old sacred Buddhist mountain. It's one of the four sacred Buddhist mountains in China. And there's, ha there's been Buddhist activity on this mountain since about the first century AD. So for the past like 2,000 years, Buddhists have been here on this mountain. It's home of the largest stone Buddhist statue, essentially the largest pre-modern statue that we know of, supposedly. It's 71 meters tall, carved out of the side of this mountain. And it's just a really cool site of pilgrimage for a lot of Buddhist people. It's a statue of the Buddha, of course. And I remember reading in the Ming and Qing dynasty, there were 70, 73, 74 Buddhist temples on this mountain, Emershan. And so in my opinion, I've always thought of Emershan outside of Chengdu as this very holy, very sacred, very religious space. But in the car ride yesterday with the, the makers and, oh, yeah, and our so guide, uh, Alex and them started talking about some really obscure Sichuan history that I've never heard about that just started blowing my mind. So it was kind of like an amazing cacophony. First of all, it was a cacophony, right? Yeah. You were in between oh all of God. that. They were like, they were all talking, at, all the talking at the time. same time. Yeah. It was incredible. So like, the driver would be talking, who was the the wife of the guy who owns the factory, right? And the sister in the back, her sister-in-law, the elder sister, me. was talking to, to Derek, right? So like, I could hear them. And the things they were talking about, they were like riffing off, it was like, you know, listening to a podcast, they're like riffing off of each other. but. They're doing it at the, it's like the audio tracks were overlaid, right? They're doing it at the same time. Anyway, so like they were talking first, they're talking about like the Tranjun, which is like the, the KMT, the notoriously like brutal uh, nationalist army in Sichuan, mm -hmm. which had gone into ancient other places and done all these massacres. But I think the sister was misremembering a fact from the long march. Because like all this started because I was like, oh, we're, we're passing this martyr cemetery, right? Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, there's a martyr cemetery here. Like, I didn't know there was like all these revolutionaries in Meishan. And he's like, don't you know, like the Chuanjun is mostly from here. The bad guys, the bad guys in the story, right? Who, who yeah. beat the, the communists. Yeah. Um, then she's like, yeah, like nine tenths, like millions of them died, she, right? She kept saying- 3.5 million. 3.5 million. She said that about seven times into my ear, like 3.5 million people they like, killed. So I met a guy in Jingzhou who during like the survey work I was doing for my master's degree. And I was like, oh, like, how did you end up, you know, here in this like really like remote village uh, across the river in Misha from Jingzhou City? And he's like, well, my dad was brought here by the Chuanjun as a Zhuanding. So he was like people who were captured in the mountains of like Chongqing yeah. and was transported to Hubei as like an indentured like forced laborer. Wow. He, like basically like reverse gulag, like <laughs> nationalist yeah. gulag was sent there as a forced laborer and then just stayed after the liberation after 1949 and then had a son there and now the son's like, 80 years old. And then, anyway, so it was like bizarre in Jingzhou seeing someone who was brought from the mountains all the way out there to the Zhanghan Plains as an indentured servant. And again, the Chuanjun, even in, in Hafeng, they have the impression right. these are the folks that came out there and murked the Hafeng Soviet back in 1932, 1933. So like, yeah, notorious. And she's like giving us all these facts about the Chuanjun, but I think she's mixing it up. 
Because yeah. she also mentions, well, and then they went to Korea and, and, and they fought you Americans and, and like, we, we fought you guys till you surrendered. And like that in itself is not the same army, right? Because Hwang yeah. was the bad guys, now she's kind of mixing it up. Right. Yes. And then she's saying like, yeah, and then it, was, it was you and the, and the other eight nations who attacked us. And that's, that's, the, Qing, that's just the Boxer Rebellion, right? So she's oh. mixing up oh. Boxer Rebellion, Korean War, <laughs> Chinese Civil War, and it's, just all, it's all coming together. And it was kind of funny. Um, so that, but, that was the 3.5 million she was talking about. Yeah, and then the, the driver, she was saying like, oh yeah, there was that really touching scene. Um, I forget the name of the show, but she saw on TikTok, she was trying to like get more hints from other people in the car of what the name of that TV series was, where it showed like the Tron Jun, the Sichuan army, you know, massacring the communists here. And, and then, you know, that's like, I think all this history is coming from like different TikTok videos, right? Uh, like assembling... <laughs> Uh, a, a it's, knowledge it's, of their past. It's post-truth, yeah. It's post-truth, right? We're just talking yeah. about, like, memories. Like, <laughs> can we be sure of anything? Yeah, I think, I think they're just, like, assembling <clears throat> all these TikTok videos into a, a narrative of, of, of national identity, a narrative of, of a background, right? And uh, well, was, well, speaking of murking entire populations in cities, what was this guy that you guys mentioned? Start talking Zhang Shenzhong is the guy, first of all. Like, he's known for, for the seven... Seven Shah Stel, where like he went around to the cities and allegedly it's it's you know it's debated now. What, what a, time is this that fall of the dissolution of the Ming Dynasty? So the Ming Dynasty lost, right? For a whole series of reasons. But like Ming Dynasty was collapsing and it's there like was seventeen hundreds? Sixteen hundreds. And there was this peasant rebel from Shanxi, because like they were just starving in Shanxi straight up. They were not not Shanxi but Shanxi, like the double A's oh, double for A's. English. So, okay. so Shanxi, peasant rebel rises up. And the Ming just have no resources. They're like, you know what? You can just be governor of Hubei. And then you stay on the Ming. And within like five months, he had then again was like, I don't want Hubei. I want to be king of the West, right? And they're like, you can be king of the West. And he's like, no, no, no. I'm in charge. He like ends up going into Anhui and then like destroying like the ancestral temples of the Ming because the Ming are from Anhui, right? The Jew oh. clan and all that. Anyway, so like he gets into trouble. He overextends, flees to Hunan, overextends, then flees to Sichuan. And by the time he's in Sichuan, um, things are going really south for the Ming. The Qing armies are, are, have already broken over. They, they, they've crossed the Huai River. They're in southern China. And he's trying to build this, you know, uh, area of support, this dynasty. Dashi, the Xi dynasty, the West dynasty he's trying to build in Sichuan. And the local population is not cooperating. And allegedly, then, he goes around to all these cities and just exterminates the whole population. Uh, we know that... From census data, there were like two or three million people initially in Sichuan. And then in the next like Qing census, there was like two thirds of the population just not there. Up to 85% by some estimates aren't there. People are, they're gone. And maybe it was famine, maybe it was disease, it was probably all of the above. Plus, indeed, it's entire city rebel. massacres, right? Where yeah. he's like, going around like, you don't, yeah, you don't, you're, you're disloyal. I'm just going to kill the entire city. Written by the victors, written by the Qing who come in, right? Yeah. Who say, oh, and we save Sichuan well, from was, these terrible... The, the sister in the car was saying he would leave this plaque, right? That's and right, she's yeah. Seen a, she's seen the plaque. Supposedly they, they found the plaque, right? Yeah. And, and the plaque is, is just like, you know, for your disloyalty, you have been punished. Sha, he says, he writes Sha seven times. Sha, 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 Sha. I'll kill you for all your disloyalties. I'll kill you, I'll kill you, I'll kill you, I'll kill you, I'll kill you. Jeez. And then supposedly he and his army went around and... Yeah, depopulated areas. But they brought him up not because they, you know, uh, are, feel like they were victimized or whatever, but like they brought him up because here in Meishan, in the, right behind us, like this wetland ties into the Lin River, and, or sorry, the Min River. And within that river, apparently his treasure ship, when he was, you know, <laughs> when he was fleeing, there was so much gold in, in, in the ship, it sunk. And over the last 20 years, there were some villages, allegedly, again, like, I'm going to put asterisks on everything they say. Supposedly, all the villages nearby, they just haven't been planting in their fields. They've just been going out into the river and digging up. Sunken like, treasure. Yeah, sunken treasure, right? <laughs> and, they've been, and then finally, about 10 years, of the, like, the government uh, put a crackdown on that. No more. So wow, like, you're done. That's, and, I mean, that's just a wild story. It's, it's like a pseudo would-be emperor, bandit rebel warlord. That's right, yep. Who took control of all of Sichuan and was just... Murdering, like just massacring depopulating villages, the population, taking all of their wealth, putting That's it on right. a boat, putting it on his ship, and then that ship sinks in the in the Min River, right? That's right. But 
I think like it's that whole area basically west of Ichang which has no people in it. And we know this, like even for example in Hafeng in that village, um, there are all of these mounds on top of the village. And I asked them like, you know, who, who's, you know, whose graves are those? And this old guy, Tian, says that those are the people that lived in Man Tai before the Qing dynasty. And when they got there, everyone was dead. No one was in the village. It was just so when the Wang family got there, no one was alive. And they don't know what happened. He thinks maybe it was a Wei, maybe it was a plague. Yeah. Everyone's dead. So there is this whole massive movement of people from Hubei, from Hunan, from Guangdong, from Guangxi to repopulate Sichuan, which leads to now the, the modern dialect spoken here, right? Yeah. It's the Yi people. It's the oh. minority people here who are, who are like the true indigenous people of Sichuan, the people mm. who've come later. Uh, they basically speak, speak this kind of like silly Mandarin, Mandarin right? <clears throat> and they've come much later. This is the repopulation efforts during the Qing dynasty. Anyway, so like this all history is confused. And I think in the popular imagination, it goes in some very interesting directions. And um, I mean, I, I, I kind of want to get into the jasmine tea. We should. But, yeah, but sure. There was, there was one more. One thing more I need, detail. I need clarification on. San Xingdui? Yeah, like the, the, the ancient civilization they were talking so about. So San Xingdui is a well-known archaeological site in Sichuan. And <laughs> it's very, very well, widely discussed from like social media here. Because there are all these really cool things they're finding in there. Like really elaborate bronzeware. Really beautiful works of art. Like chandeliers. Incredible like totems they're pulling out of the ground. From, from ancient, ancient history. Right? Really ancient. Like as, as, as old as the Zhou Dynasty, right? So like... 2000 BC, like... Uh, that's right, and there's a lot of debate. Okay, first of all, are, would these people who are living here even call themselves Chinese, right? <clears throat> Is this a separate civilization? Like the ancient civilization down in Yunnan, right? They probably wouldn't have thought of themselves as Chinese, but it's, it's a point... And on the one hand, it's a point of, like, historical, cultural debate. Is this culture related to the, the um, contemporaneous Zhou dynasty? But... I would say the popular narrative media here is like, wow, look at how intelligent, how amazing our ancestors were. Maybe it's some Sichuan local pride. You know, they had fully at like automaton hearts that were working, the guy was saying, right? <laughs> and <laughs> and these is like and like the government has had to stop has to stop excavations out there because like they're trying to keep the truth from us that actually it's too much ancient technology. It was like, yeah, it was like, well, and then he said this thing where it's just like it just goes to show it. It's like we always knew civil like the humanity builds itself up and then it's just like, you know, uh, wiped cyclically out. wiped out, right? And we come back. So this is like wow. some older, ancient, Atlantean, you know, uh, fingers of the gods, kind of like Graham Hancock kind of thinking where, oh, there was this ancient pre-civilization. And like here, this is like, you know, one of the, the treasure troves of that. So it has to be shut down because they don't want us to know how amazing humans used to be. We all can be immortal, right? <laughs> There's no need for us to get sick. The truth is in there. And he's like a... Kind of like a he's TCM like, fanatic, right? Yeah, he like, only like, drinks flowers. Only drinks flowers. And then during dinner, he was like messing with my fingers. He's like, you feel that? It's your pancreas. You got, you got to like play oh, with your yeah. fingers. Yeah, I, saw him, gonna... I saw him like assessing your wrist and being like, okay, that's right. this issue. Yep, yeah. He, so he's, like, he's a big <clears throat> believer in TCM. Tried to get his daughter, his older daughter, who's now in a senior in high school, to do TCM. Not interested. But this is, this so. is also, I really vibe with this guy. 100%, like, like yeah. 100%, like he's a, he's a really cool down-to-earth guy like we will talk about it later he started his own accidental cooperative that's right yeah he's, he's very reasonable very easy to work with very friendly right. and then it's like yeah like here comes this like and it's cool because i know a lot of like western american conspiracy theories but i don't know a whole lot of chinese ones and yeah that's yeah. it so sun Xing Dui is the ancient civilization and the truth is out there and the truth you know. is out there i remember hearing one about the the mendicant knife sellers that are like, we'll read your fortune and sell you a knife. Oh, and then okay. And then the fortunes always come true and they'll just go through towns. And every now and then you'll see, and it's, it's a more of a modern uh, conspiracy theory where it's like you'll still see the mendicant knife sellers and you'll ask them for a fortune. And then they'll tell you something that will come true and then they'll be like, if it doesn't come true, your knife is free. Right. <laughs> and then I leave no contact information and go on to the next town, right? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, let's yeah, back, um, back to reality. Back to um, reality, back to Jasmine tea. So, the, first off, getting out to the tea house. So this is your uh, 
directors, not your directors, your advisor's childhood friend who That's introduced right. us to a tea house in his home village. Yes, the conspiracy theorist and driver in this whole And operation. the two sisters. And so we get there, yeah. and we, start, we meet the two sisters, and we're drinking a lot of jasmine teas. And so what was your first impression? Because I remember you taking a lot of notes as soon as we got there. And they're telling you all about, you know, this is good jasmine, that's not good jasmine, this is what we make, this is what well, we Well, I, I think, you know, when we first got there, they didn't know what to make of us. Yeah. So they're just kind of BSing us at the very yeah. beginning. Because I remember they're just like, they're trying to show me these two pictures with different <laughs> lighting and being like, you see that tea? That's the tea from the high mountain. You see that tea? That's the tea from the low mountain. And here they think like a yellower, lighter tea color on the leaf indicates it's high mountain, indicates high quality, right? And they're really trying to push that. Mm -hmm. And um, that just seems like marketing. So at the beginning, they were like giving us like marketing kind of and stuff, I, right? I was, I was not vibing with them. I, I vibed with like our, our driver, but I did not vibe with them so much until ev eventually they kind of won me over towards the end of it. But uh, yeah, they're, they're very much, we get in there and they're just like giving us a pitch. That's right. And I can't yeah. tell if it's like her personality or if it's marketing because she was chugging Red Bulls, right? That's right. Yeah, I, it's, I can't figure out if she had four or five in the course of the day. I remember, I remember at, like, at the end when we were heading out, I was like, I was pretty fatigued after the first pitch we heard. I was like, give me a Red Bull. And then she has like a huge bag of like all these like milks and Red Bulls. And then she just like, as we're going along in the day, drinking Red Bulls, tossing them out <laughs> onto the road. <laughs> she, so when we were at, at the first place where you flew the drone, which is yeah. a funny clip you can put in here, yeah. uh, I remember like, I, I heard like the ting, the ting <laughs> of it hitting the ground. So she had one there for sure. She had the long skinny one in the car. <laughs> oh, she had the blue one. Yeah. She had the blue, she had, yeah, at least two yellow ones and one blue one. But yeah. the whole bag was gone by the end. I think yeah. I only had one. I had one. Okay, so she only had three. Okay. But she had three, three Red Bulls then. But she also, she talked like she was on Red Bulls. Like she would, really, really, really quick bullets of machine gun talking, talking, punctuated only by, and then she'd keep going. And like, also, like, she was kind of afraid in her pauses that you would start talking, so she would just step on herself a whole lot of just, like, she'd give us a ton of information. But anyways. Anyway, so at first, you know, I was, like, I was kind of like, oh, man. But I was, like, taking notes. And then um, later, I think once we demonstrated, we had some modicum of knowledge of tea. <laughs> Things got a bit better. And uh, they gave us a much more balanced narrative. So why, why drink Sichuan jasmine tea? Uh, jasmine tea has grown... It's produced in four areas of China. It's produced in Yunnan, it's produced in Sichuan, produced in Guangxi at Hangzhou, and it's produced in Fujian at Fuzhou. So there's four places you could get jasmine tea. Uh, and Sichuan, this area of Sichuan, only produces about 13% of the national yield. Okay. So like it's not, it's not even uh, the number one place, although it is growing. It's the fastest growing area for it. Uh, and their pitch was, well, in Fuzhou, which I think you kind of, you expansion, you touched on a little bit, like historically, um, it was not great green tea. Yeah. The green tea they had put into jasmine tea is not green tea you could drink on its own. Mm. So their pitch here was, we were already making green tea. We were already making maofeng. We were already making maojen. And then, hey, they got these like, you know, uh, they realized there was a demand about 50, 60 years ago. And they start taking their already good drinkable green tea and adding flowers. Yeah adding jasmine so like which honestly this does kind of check out because sure i've had the jasmine teas in fujian and i didn't like any of them like in my opinion it's always been like the green tea is not good enough quality and it's like as you said like it's only good with the jasmine flowers and we see this in a lot of different drinks you know throughout the world throughout history like think of like an old fashioned old fashioned was made from like really terrible bourbon like really mm. undrinkable spirits and what you would do is you would mix it with a bunch of su sweetness sugar with it this is the invention of the cocktail where it's a, you oh. take something that you can't drink alone <laughs> and then you mix it with a bunch of things and then it's suddenly drinkable and so the uh, idea of like adding flowers to something that's not so good and then it becomes a better tea so okay yeah i, th I think that's probably <clears throat> a, a fair uh, speculation as to the origin yeah the origin of, of jasmine tea <clears throat> And quite possibly, right? It was something, again, kind of made for foreigners from the get-go, right? Yeah. So it was made in Fuzhou, much like red tea, much like oolong tea. This is kind of a tea which is always made to sell somewhere else. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. But honestly, like, having the teas in Sichuan, because we've had a lot of teas like the Maofeng, the Maojen, um, and the, what was it, the Ganlu? Ganlu, yeah, the Ganlu. Ganlu, and then the She, what's the sparrow's tongue? 
Uh, such, uh, Chiesa, 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 Chiesa. Which she says they don't call it sparrow's tongue. Chiesa, yeah, here it's Jie Ching. They call Jie it Jie Ching. Ching. So bamboo, 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 bamboo leaf green. Bamboo leaf green. And so she's like, yeah, like nobody in Sichuan calls it sparrow's tongue. That's right. Or maybe no one here at least. Or maybe no one in that tea shop at least. <laughs> maybe, maybe she doesn't. <laughs> maybe she doesn't call it Chiesa. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was a just small piece of interesting information where it's like, yeah, like the sparrow's tongue, it didn't seem very, very popular with what they're making. They're mostly drinking the malfong. Yeah, and that's always like, like one of the first questions I was there is like, what did what did your parents drink growing up here? Uh, did yeah. they drink GH thing? I'm like, and her so they had all these beautiful like glass cups lined up for us, right? Oh and then in her mug in the corner, she was drinking malfong, right? Yeah. So like that's not the tea in the, in the morning when they're drinking on their own, they aren't actually drinking GH thing. They aren't actually drinking even jasmine tea. They're, right. Yeah. They're drinking that malfong. <clears throat> they but, said they don't even drink that much jasmine. Right. That's right, yeah. And, and her impression, oh, you mean why go around? Like, you foreigners, you guys are the ones who drink jasmine tea. Yeah. <laughs> she has Italian, Korean, Japanese customers. So. Yeah. And so eventually we do get out to her tea garden. We meet her, yes. her grandparents. That her would parents. be the husband's parents. The husband's parents. Husband's okay. parents, yeah. Husband, husband's parents. And they were very friendly. They were out in the fields picking tea. It is, <clears throat> it is April 15th, it's tax day. Tax day. Uh, anyways, ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> Go moving on. <laughs> uh, and so they're out in the garden picking tea, and it's summer tea now. Even though it's like kind of like mid-April, you would still think it's spring tea, but they're saying this is the summer pick. That's right. right? Yep. And it's just like it's, it still looks beautiful though. Still like small leaves, you can still see the buds on it and stuff like that. There aren't a whole lot of pickers. She was saying if you want more pickers, come here like a month ago, like mid mid March, right? And their picking standard is incredible. It's like a it's a pick standard well above what we're getting in Hafang for this time of the season. Because like yeah. I saw what they had in the bag there, and although it really good, yeah, their fingernails were, were hitting it too much. Oh. You could kind of see like it was it was a little rough on the ends there. Okay. None the nonetheless, like um, it was just like the. the Always, it was either just bud or bud and the one partially open leaf. That would be like the highest pick quality in Ensha, which yeah. we can't even get consistently the first week. And they're getting it All more than a month after the beginning of the season. Yeah, I so. mean, there's, there's a reason Sichuan's taking over the world of tea. Like. Sure, yeah, it was like an incredible pick. Um, yeah. and, they're, and they aren't paying very much for it, I think she was yeah. saying. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it. No, I think she was, I think it was... 15 RMB a gin, I think, was, was the price there. For the fresh leaves? They're getting it today, which is still... More than it's in Hafang right now, but again, but, like but that, if the pick is that small. The pick is that small. That that's like a quality of pick we pay forty or fifty for Hafang first week. I'm, I'm used to week. in a lot of places they'll do it by the day, like two hundred quai per day, right? And so, how many gin can you pick in a day? Like maybe fifteen, twenty. Yeah, I I think she she was saying like because a couple of days ago the sister was still picking right the older one, and I think she was saying she made like a a hundred ninety to a hundred a couple of days ago. Ninety to a hundred gin. R and B. She's okay. taking her, her take home. Her take home price. Was, was, <clears throat> but that's the sister picking. Right? That's the sister so, picking. So that's right? not like a professional picker necessarily. I like, think. So like as the day moved on, I think I realized <laughs> that older sister was like she just she picks tea, uh, whereas the wife she sells tea. Oh, okay. And that the, the more they talk, the more I realized like she just like the sister knew where the tea fields were. She knew where to find. Whereas the, the sister who sold tea, <coughs> she couldn't actually identify the indigenous cultivar so well. Uh, whereas the old sister was like, "That's it. That's, that's it. it. That's okay. it." Right. So I think yeah, the vision of labor and so was there. When we got out into the garden, their, their first garden. What do you think of the mixed ecology? I remember seeing you know there were the nice tidy rows of the tea bushes. But there's a lot of other, you know, it wasn't a whole mountainside, right? It wasn't like that second place we went to. It was, it was very mixed. Yeah, so speaking of the mixed ecology, I saw they had mixed rapeseed. I saw they had mixed right. cabbage. I saw on the lower rows they had potatoes, which is what they do in Hafung too. So, like, I saw not, nothing which would produce nitrogen, nothing which would necessarily help the tea. Uh, but there was an essay from Zhang Su, very, I think just two years ago, saying that they found... When you co-crop corn, mm. not well known for making soils happier or healthier or more nu nutrient rich, there were still some symbiotic relationships happening where there was a healthier soil biome. Okay. So although maybe the available nitrogen content may decrease, you saw more microorganisms, mm. you saw more things thriving in the soil when you mixed two crops together. Again, corn and tea. Corn is probably the last thing you think of. Yep. So I reckon, without any knowledge of anything to go off of, that by mixing the potatoes, 
by mixing the rapeseed, by mixing the cabbage, there is still something positive happening for that soil uh, microbiome. Hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I was like, for me, it's always something I look at when I get out into the mountains, especially a new location, because I've noticed in, even in Ensher, I've, is it Xuan An? Xuan An that Xuan has like that big uh, Wu Tai? Sure, yeah, that's yeah. right, that's right. And yep. it's like a beautiful government plot. Everyone loves it. It looks stunning, but it's monoculture. It's a mountain of just pure tea bushes. Well, and something I noticed there is like the soil. It was red, right? The soil in was, and here. Here, it's yeah. the same color it's like as the plot we have high. So there's like, um, there's a couple of plots we have in Hafeng, right? And there's one plot where I've noticed like half of the tea sprouts we planted died. Oh. And just this, like these two areas, I had to figure out like what happened. And I took it to this old guy, maybe we'll meet in the next couple of days, professor nice. uh, who used to lead the, the tea department at my university. And he took one look at the soil and was like, this soil is no good. Oh. This is like, the, this is the red soil. This is not what you want for growing tea. Huh. And I saw they had planted some sprouts in the same looking soil, also side of a hill, also without tarps, same conditions. They had two die out of 20. Or we had maybe 10 die out of 20. So Is it a different cultivar? Like Maybe it's the cultivar? Yeah, because and then I, I asked her, it's like, how, when, when did you guys plant it? She planted it a bit earlier than we did, but it's like the, yeah, it was a stunning difference in outcome. And then... Yeah. Because I remember the, in Shishan Dao, like the Bilo Chun, he says the soil here is very acidic. In other tea plants, other tea cultivars don't do well here. Uh, so it could and be the cultivar, so it yeah. Could, it could be the cultivar because also like, you know, in Yunnan, I saw the same soil in Yunnan, right? And in Yunnan, they're doing the different, different type of Camellus sinensis, right? Camellus sinensis asomica, the big leaf varietal. So that, that could be it, yeah. Because I feel like... Um, <laughs> Dragon Ball 43, like... What they're growing here is, is number nine, right? Number oh, nine, Which yeah. is like a, it's like a Sichuan cultivar I'd never heard of before I yeah, came here. Maybe we can pick up some seedlings. Yeah, so that seems to be doing well. And yeah, so that was just, it was very interesting to see. And... It was cool to see the mix of cultivars, where they had the indigenous right next to the number nine, right next to the Angi Bai Cha. And <laughs> yeah. And so that, that was nice cool, mix. too, seeing yeah. like the Angi Bai Cha, seeing the number nine, and then seeing like they, Lao they Chuan mentioned... Lao the old, old the Sichuan, old, right? old heirloom. Yeah. And they mentioned, like, I remember hearing like Da Bai Hao. Yeah, like Fujing Da Bai. Yeah, Fujing Da Bai. 131. Like, they, were all 131. Like... They, they have essentially all the different cultivars from China growing here, depending on what they want to make. And so, let's see, where do you want to go from here? So I think we should talk a little bit more about when do you get jasmine in the year, right? Oh, that's right, yeah. So like, because we, we got here, it's April 15th, and there's no jasmine tea. Why green tea's that? almost done. Green so teas, they have green tea. They have the green tea, but the flowers that go in, so historically, like 10, 20 years ago, if you want to put jasmine flavor into green tea, you don't go in for the flowers. You just take the oil, right? There's that extract you put <laughs> yeah. in there. And it, it tastes, it gets the job yeah, done. It tastes I've, like I've, jasmine. I've had way too many bad. But like, it also can, as she was saying, it also can make it way too strong, like yeah. overpowering. You just, you just taste jasmine. Not only do you smell it, you just taste it. And that's not what you want. So the government's cracked down on it here because Chenwei County is the place where they grow the jasmine flowers in Sichuan, also part of Omeishan uh, Prefecture. Yeah. So as, consequently, they've really cracked down on that. And everyone now has to wait for the flowers. And the flowers don't really bloom properly until May. But they're saying, like, if you want the best fragrance, you have to wait until July. When you wow. pick the flowers, it's, you have to do two bakes with it. And again, I asked her, it's not a typical tea kiln. It's not a wok like it was historically in Fujian. It's neither of them. There's a special machine we haven't seen yet where they're doing two bakes. So you bake it, right? and then you let it dry, and then tea is great at absorbing smells, right? Yeah. It's after it's baked, then it sucks and sucks and sucks. <laughs> then you bake it again, and you let it suck and suck and suck, and then you take out the jasmine flowers. So the way I've seen it done before is they do different rows, right? So they have like that screen, the really fine mesh screen, and they'll put a bunch of the freshly baked jasmine flowers on it, and then on a row above it, they'll put another screen with all of the green tea. Mm. And then they'll do this in like, you know, several different layers of like flowers, green tea, flowers, green tea. And so the green tea is absorbing all of the aroma of the flowers, but it doesn't have any actual flowers in it, right? Critical, critical, critical point. point. Yeah, there's no, like, so when you, when you get the, when the tea is done, right, when it gets sent back from Chen Wei to the tea house here, there are no flowers in that tea. 
and then they have to then add dried flowers <laughs> to the product per the customer's demand. In the South, where they have less of a history of drinking jasmine tea, it's kind of more of a new thing for, I guess they were saying middle-aged women, they want to see the flowers in there. Yeah. Whereas in the north of China, for example, Cheyenne's father, he loves jasmine tea. Uh -huh. No flowers. No flowers. So, so. so the flowers are added as an affectation. Like, they're not necessary. They don't do anything for it. They just make it look like there's flowers in it. Yeah. And because yeah. it's interesting because I've heard, you know, in Fujian, the saying is like, oh, like, good jasmine tea doesn't have any flowers. Bad jasmine tea has flowers in it. The good jasmine tea doesn't need the flowers to have the fragrance. I wonder then about osmanthus black tea. Because I feel like I've, had, I've, had, I've added osmanthus flowers before to a tea. Oh. And I could taste them. I could yeah. taste the flowers I've added. So I wonder. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if, yeah, if, if that osmanthus black tea is actually coming from the flowers being in them or it, in the process. We should... That would be Yenjo fun to shot. see. Yenjo, that needs to be researched. We'll research this. <laughs> We're going to pick out all of, the, all of the tea from the flowers and see. Because I, I know like when I buy it, she'll send me an extra bag of jasmine. Right? Not jasmine of the the osmanthus like little flowers, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, is this necessary? But it does smell beautiful, the flowers. Well, these jasmine flowers, I'm not sure if they smell very good. So. <laughs> they taste fine. So if you eat one by mistake, don't worry about it. It's yeah. a <laughs> right, exactly. tasty little flower. <laughs> yeah, I guess like kind of, I guess like I want to talk about what I did not expect when I came here. Sure. Um, beyond, of course, the front tea not being terrible. Um, uh, also, I guess like I thought we were going to Omeishan from the beginning, right? Yeah. And then when we got the tickets. I was like, all right, Omeishan. And he's like, no, 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 go to Meishan. Meishan. With the uh removed. And we got here, and there was no mountain. There's so no I come mountain. to Meishan, there's no mountain. I was super confused, I guess. Right by Laoshan. Yeah, not geological, but geographically. I was confused, yeah. where, where the heck were we going? Because I, I come to this place, no mountains. And then the tea is far away. The first vibe I got here was like, ah, oh, shoot, I've messed up. Like, yeah. well, here I am in... If you well, look fo here, follow the lead. Yeah, yeah. like the, the, the Chengdu Sichuan Plains right now, basically. Yeah. Follow the lead in, in, into the abyss. You know, maybe it's too bright. <laughs> I'm sure they can't see it. <laughs> they can't see it anyways. <laughs> but yeah, imagine, imagine it's flat land, right? And there's a marsh behind us even, right? Mm -hmm. And I was kind of bummed out. And then they're taking me to Hot Pot, because of course it's Sichuan. And we're waiting for, for Derek to arrive on the train. And as we're passing by, I see Su Dong Po. We're yeah. currently in like Dongpo Hotel, right? We went yeah. to Su Dong Po. Which is the, the famous poet Su Shi. Which his, his pen name was uh, Su Dong Po. And this is yeah, his hometown. His hometown, I guess. And there's a temple here, the, the, the Su family temple yep. for the three Su's. In this hotel quarter, as you walk by, even here, in this, as I look behind the camera here, I see, yeah, they, see Su Dong po. They, they have all of these works that were either as paintings or as poems or from other people in the Su clan later in the Ming and Qing dynasty. And it's like really the theme of this whole city. Yeah. And that, I guess, kind of like made a connection for me because I remember uh, a long time ago, I was making that blog post, like translation for the Bilo Chun, and there was that poem mm -hmm. from the guy himself when he was on the lake there. Uh, lake Tai, was it? Yeah. He was talking about, about like seeing the snow on the lake and this beautiful image and well, like... Also, like he, he's the one who did the calligraphy for Long Jing, like Lao Long Jing. Oh, and so wow. He's, he's very famous for like green tea in that region as well. So, yeah. and now we've come to his hometown. So like yeah. seeing, I guess seeing that ancestral temple and then being now in Dongpo Hotel as I speak <laughs> to you, I feel like, you know, uh, we've made a connection. We've made some guanxi with, with good people. We've, we've come back to, to the source of this tea legend. And I think he'd be proud to know that, although at the time, was there any tea even produced here? A thousand years ago? I don't know. But I like, mean, honestly, like coming up from Yunnan, from Sichuan, this is some of the ancestral points, the original points of tea production, right? From Dashui Shan and Yunnan. Sichuan is always famed as like the ancestral home of tea. You see it in Chengdu and old history and stuff like that. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I would assume it probably came from this region spread through China. Though, Su Dong Po was probably a little late. It was probably around four or 500 a AD. Su Dong Po is like Song Dynasty, so that's 1100s, like 1000s. That's right. And you said when you were in Suzhou, there's this dish we had last night that was fantastic. Yeah, su the Su Dong Po Ro. Su Dong Po Ro, which <laughs> Suzhou also claims it as its own, yeah. but may actually have an origin here, or at least they claim it here. It's contested, right? Who knows? But at the same point, like yesterday in the factory, all of these Bilo Chun, like production, yeah. all these devices, right? Interesting, yeah. And so like, Bilo Chun, you know, of course, Suzhou, Suzhou made, 
but now it has become Sichuan. So like Suzhou has appropriated Sudongpo, maybe even su the, the me and the story and his personage, right, as part of their local history. But at the same time now, I think Sichuan has the last laugh as they're going to get all the Bilo Chun production. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we'll have more yeah. to talk about in Ensha, I think. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, what's, what's really interesting is learning about jasmine tea, where it's like, it's, sir, it's the early spring picks of the green tea, but then the jasmine flowers are added later, and the jasmine flowers are more of a summer harvest thing. And so just getting this, um, I have this like time map of China, like where I need to be at certain times to see the tea production. And so now I have a new place for June or July, right? That's Go to right. Sichuan to see the plucking of jasmine and see the making of jasmine tea. This is a tea that, you know, has really grown on me that I'm excited to actually visit the farm. And I'm actually happy that it does come from a farm <laughs> because our connection point was, you know, your a, a, the owner of, and, yeah, like a truck dispatch cooperative well, I, thing. I, I, we didn't get to talk about him enough, but yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> he started Just, his own cooperative with that truck dispatch. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and so I'm, I'm really excited to see like the actual origin point of it, to taste the teas, to see the factory, and get that peace of mind as far as like, okay, this does come from a smaller plot of land, you know, only a couple moo, they have different gardens, different places, and stuff like that. It's not some big mass conglomerate production that is faceless, right? That's right. We actually right. have some people behind it, so. That's right, yeah. Well, uh, thank you guys for joining. This is a visual podcast for those listening. It's also going to be available on YouTube, on the One River Tea YouTube channel. Again, this is Alex, who's been in the cooperative since the genesis. You know, we started this together, us and Cheyenne, which maybe we'll get to see later. And yeah, a lot of cool stuff coming out of Hubei and Hafeng, and we'll do some podcasts talking about that soon. So until next time, guys, Derek from One River Tea. And Alex, too. All right. We're happy. Peace out. Mm -hmm.